In this session, we talk about some design aspects of heat exchangers, focusing mainly on the shell and tube heat exchanger. So first, for all heat exchanger design, the basics of heat transfer remain the same. And this main equation Q equals UA delta T, that is always applicable. Here Q is the heat transfer between the two fluids, U is the overall heat transfer coefficient, a is the heat transfer area and delta T is the temperature difference and we use the subscript M here just to denote that the temperature difference may not be the same throughout the length of the heat exchanger. So we need to have some estimation of the mean temperature difference. So for heat exchangers, two types of calculations may need to be done. So for a new heat exchanger design, we may know the heat duty and the temperature difference meaning we know what's the hot fluid and what's the cold fluid and what are the temperatures and flow rate so that will determine the heat duty and the temperature difference and for this case we need to determine the size of the heat exchanger and the resulting overall heat transfer coefficient now for an existing heat exchanger the size is given so we need to re-estimate the overall heat transfer coefficient this may happen because there may be significant amount of fouling and you may need to determine whether the extent of fouling is acceptable or not or whether you need to clean the heat exchanger. So for those given Q and you may need to calculate the achievable delta T. Now the design of heat exchanger becomes an iterative procedure simply because we have U and A these two parameters and both of them depend on the shell and tube diameter, their layout length, baffle type, and the number of shell and tube passes. So all of these design parameter affect the heat transfer area as well as the heat transfer coefficient by affecting the flow properties of the fluids. That's why it becomes an iterative procedure. Now typically there are some given conditions. Inlet conditions are given. Typically we know the temperatures, the pressure, the compositions, the flow rates, and the phase condition of the two inlet streams. So that defines the delta T as well as the heat duty. So if a heating or cooling utility is to be selected, it's selected from a standard table along with inlet and exit temperatures. Meaning that for example, if you're using ambient air or you're using water from a natural sources, that inlet temperature is defined. Also, the exit temperature may be restricted by environmental regulations. So those conditions need to be taken into account for the purpose of design. Now typically the designs are carried out in well-defined steps. First of all, you start with the allocation of the streams. So for example, for a double part heat exchanger, which stream goes to the annulus, which stream goes to the inner pipe. For a shell and tube heat exchanger, which stream goes to the shell side, which stream goes to the tube side. And that all depends on the properties and conditions of the two streams. So the first step is to decide which stream goes to what side. Now based on the information about the streams, the overall energy balance is carried out to calculate the heat duty and the remaining existing condition of the streams. Now we cannot define all the flow rates and the temperatures. For a hot and cold stream, if both flow rates are given and three of the four temperatures are given, the other become fixed. Or if you know the inlet and outlet temperature of both of the streams, then the flow rate of one stream is fixed depending on the flow rate of the other stream because the heat given by one stream is taken by the another stream. So the energy balance should be met. Also, if a utility stream is used, its flow rate is calculated from an overall energy balance. What should be the flow rate of the utility? That's determined based on any restriction on the temperatures. Now, when we have done the energy balance, you need to check whether there is a temperature crossover this ha might happen because if you are using a parallel flow or counter current flow, so always you need to maintain that the second law of thermodynamics is not violated. Meaning that if for a counter current heat exchanger, the temperature profile may be something like this, where the exit temperature of this cold stream is higher than the exit temperature of the hot stream that's possible for a counter current flow however for this same thing you cannot get in a 
parallel flow. I mean, that's possible. That temperature condition is not possible for the parallel flow. However, that's possible for the counter current flow. So, to make sure that this type of scenarios is not happening with the temperature range that you are considering. Also, when there is a phase change occurring, so you need to make sure that there is no temperature crossover, something like this one is taking place. Now, once you have the fluid allocation done, once you have the initial energy balance is done, and you have made sure that there is no temperature crossover taking place, typically the design procedure is start with the assumption of an initial heat transfer coefficient. And this is done from standard range of values for the given system for a fluid pair, typical standard values of overall coefficient are available in the literature. So we start with some assumed value within the given range and then calculate the log mean temperature difference. So we talked about that a mean value of the temperature difference is needs to be used and for a shell and tube exchanger the log mean temperature difference is used. In another session we will look at details about the log mean temperature difference. So when you have the overall transfer coefficient assumed and you have estimated a log mean temperature difference, a preliminary estimate of the heat transfer area is made. Now, if the area is too large, typically if it's larger than around 8,000 square feet, then one heat exchanger is not enough. You need to use multiple heat exchangers. So we have talked about multi-pass shell and tube heat exchanger. That shell side can have more than one pass and the tube side can have also more than one pass. And for those cases, the log mean temperature difference needs a correction factor. And we'll see in another session how this correction factor is calculated. And the configuration of the heat exchanger depends on the correction factor. A desirable value is greater than 0.85 and if it's less than 0.75, typically it's considered to be unacceptable. Now, if the correction factor is low, meaning less than 0.75, then we need to choose a different configuration. And how to choose it? For a given number of shell pass, the value of FTL is not affected significantly on the number of tube passes. So the value of FT depends on the number of shell passes. So if the FT value is really very low, less than even 0.75, we may need to choose a higher number of shell passes. Now, once the configuration is chosen, we need to estimate the individual heat transfer coefficient, meaning that tube side heat transfer coefficient and the shell side heat transfer coefficient. Now, typically a tube velocity in the range between 1 to 10 feet is selected with a typical value is chosen as 4 feet per second. As I mentioned earlier, the flow rate of the streams are typically given and if you choose a certain velocity, so you are defining how much tube area you need. So that gives you the total required inside tube cross-sectional area to maintain that particular velocity of the fluid. And then you choose a tube size and the total number of tubes per pass calculate to obtain the required area. So from the flow rate to get a desired fluid velocity, you get the required flow area. And then when you get the required flow area, you choose the size of the tubes and that will tell you how many tubes are needed. Now when you get how many tubes are needed, you choose the tube length because you need to get a certain area for heat exchange. To meet the heat exchanger area, you choose the tube length. Now again, you may need to adjust the tube side velocity and the tube length to get an integer area of tube passes. And then based on the velocity and the flow conditions, you can calculate the heat transfer coefficient for the tube side. Now also you need to calculate the heat transfer area for the shell side. So for that you need to determine the shell dimensions and that depends on the number and length of tubes. Shell side calculation involves also the baffle configuration. Minimum baffle spacing is 20% of the shell inside diameter and maximum is 100%. Segmental baffle is most common with a segment height of 75% which is referred to as 25% baffle cut. Meaning that the length of the baffle is 75% of the shell diameter meaning that 25% of the shell diameter remains open. So that's called 25% baffle cut. So maximum baffle cut is 45%. Now once the shell dimensions and the baffle configurations are selected, the shell side heat transfer coefficient can be calculated from the flow and liquid properties. So we know the flow rate, then it will determine the flow area, from there you will get the flow velocity of the shell side liquid, from there you can estimate the shell side heat transfer coefficient. 
Now, once you get the tube side heat transfer coefficient and the shell side heat transfer coefficient, and you already know the material, so you get the conduction heat transfer coefficient. And using a standard fouling factor values for the fluids under consideration, you can calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. Now, if the overall heat transfer coefficient matches with what you started at the beginning, then the calculation is terminated. If not, the calculation is repeated by taking the new estimated value as the guess. That's how it become an iterative procedure. So in summary, the steps involved in the design of a shell and tube heat exchanger it starts with the allocation of the fluid. Then you need to perform an overall energy balance. Then you need to check whether there is a temperature crossover. And then you start the design procedure by assuming an overall heat transfer coefficient. This will give you the area and based on the area of heat exchanger, you start the tube side calculations. For a given flow rate, you need to maintain some fluid velocity and that will give you the flow area. Based on the flow area, you can determine the tube size and number of tubes. And then to maintain certain heat exchanger area, you choose the length of the tubes. And again, this length and size of the tubes and the number of tubes needs to be adjusted to get an integer number of tube passes. And when you have all the configuration set, you can calculate the flow conditions to get the tube side heat transfer coefficient. And then you move on to the shell side and the shell side configuration will depend on the number of tubes. And then you decide the type of baffles and the baffle spacing. This will give you the flow area. From there, you can get the flow properties and calculate the shell side heat transfer coefficient. Once you have got the tube side and shell side heat transfer coefficient, you can estimate the overall heat transfer coefficient using the conduction heat transfer coefficient of the tube walls and also the fouling factor for the given fluids. If the estimated value matches the initial guess, the calculation is terminated. Otherwise, the calculation is repeated by assuming the estimated value as the new guess. We'll look at details how to calculate the tube side heat transfer coefficient and the shell side heat transfer coefficient and the overall heat transfer coefficient. So here the procedure for the design of heat exchanger is summarized. So you start with specifying the fluid flow rates, temperature and the required heat duty. So select the type of heat exchangers to be used and choose a trial value for the overall heat transfer coefficient and calculate the mean temperature difference and this will give you the area required and decide on what's the exchanger layout you want to use and calculate the individual heat transfer coefficient. From the individual heat transfer coefficient, you calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient and compare with the trial value. If there's a difference, you go back to the previous steps to continue the calculation. Once it's terminated, also you need to calculate the delta P and if the delta P does not meet the requirement for the process, you may need to choose for different configuration of the heat exchanger and repeat the entire procedure. Finally, you need to further optimize the design from a cost perspective of the heat exchanger. Thank you.